shows picture and the case. Uh, if you have any questions during your talk, um, please write them down in the paper. Two sons and four daughters. 
Now, a little background information about this tribe, as they're very, very important to the story of Islam. They were the ruling tribe of Mecca, and they were the most powerful tribe in Arabia. Uh, they ruled via council. They didn't have one clan that actually ruled over all of Mecca. They ruled via council, and the chair of the council would um, move around among the three largest clans, who were the uh, Umayyads, the Hashemites, and the Mahzumis. And Muhammad was actually born into the Hashemite clan, which is one of the major clans of Quraysh. So, this is actually the uh, Hawk of Quraysh, and this is a modern adaptation of the Hawk of Quraysh. It's used as a symbol of Arab nationalism today. It's the coat of arms of Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Syria, and it previously uh, represented Egypt, Libya, and the Federation of Arab uh, States. Uh, this current uh, version of it is actually in use by Bashar al-Assad's government in Syria. So, Muhammad actually had a very good relationship with the council. Um, he was a very gifted arbitrator, and he had a, a, a good reputation as a fair mediator, so they would often bring him in whenever they couldn't agree on certain issues. Um, so he had a good relationship with the council, and his uncle was actually the chair of the council when he started proclaiming to be a prophet of God. Um, but despite having a good relationship with the council, he wasn't happy with what they were doing. He was upset with the state of Mecca. And he thought that the city was unjust, he thought it was corrupt, and as he got older, he would isolate himself from Mecca. And when he was 40 years old, he would go up a mountain near Mecca called Jebel al-Nur, which actually means the mountain of light. And he would go inside a cave and meditate for days with his wife bringing him um, food and water. And this is where the story of Islam begins, and here is where we have to pause history for a little bit. Because what happens next is not anything we can prove, but it's very important because it's how the story gets started. While in this cave, the Hayat cave in, Saudi, in modern day Saudi Arabia, Muhammad says that he had a vision of an angel visiting him from God. An angel that would speak to him words from God. And he ran down the mountain, he ran to his wife, and she actually became the very first Muslim. And since she's held in very high, high regard in Muslim culture, they say that she believed in him before he believed in himself, as um, he actually thought he had gone crazy. Um, he was seeing visions of an angel, and he was like, yep, I've gone mad. Uh, but this is where it all got started, and the Saudis have actually written the very first words of the Quran at the entrance of this cave. They are, read in the name of your Lord who created. And this is the mountain. Jebel al-Nur, where Muhammad would um, go to meditate for days away from what he saw a corrupt and unjust city of Mecca. Now, he, he now has this message, we're back into history, right? He now has this message and he's got to tell someone, because God's telling him to tell this message to the people, and he's a little bit scared of how it would be um, taken. So he begins preaching in secret. Most of the people who are told about his message are slaves, um, because he went and spoke to the underprivileged of society. Uh, he attracted a lot of slaves, a lot of Arabs who were not Quraysh, because in Mecca the Quraysh were the ruling tribe and all the other Arabs were second, third, fourth class citizens, um, Africans and women. And actually the main, um, the, the earliest converts could fit into several of these categories. Bilal, who was the first person to ever call the Muslim um, call a prayer, he was an African slave. Uh, Sumaya was the first person who was ever murdered um, because she said she was Muslim. She was a non she Arab, she was a woman. Um, and so these were the people that he attracted, with very few exceptions, like Uthman, who we mentioned earlier and who we will talk about later. Now the council knew that something was going on, they would hear whispers of what Muhammad was doing, but for the most part, they left him alone. They had a good relationship with him, and they kind of saw Islam as a fad. You know, the lower classes would take it up, and then it would die away. Uh, but the thing is, it didn't really die away, did it? Or else we would not be here. Uh, Islam kind of grew, and it started attracting a lot of attention in Mecca, and the council got really angry when their children started becoming Muslim. And the way this happened was through their slaves. Uh, oftentimes, the councilmen would have children who were very close to their slaves, and their slaves had become Muslim, 
and then the children had become Muslim. So the councilmen became very angry, and they be oops, they began torturing, uh, killing, and eventually boycotting the Muslims. They signed a treaty, which did not number one, it did not allow the Muslims to leave Mecca. They blocked off their exits, and uh, they boycotted them. They wouldn't allow them to join in the local economy. So for several years, uh, being associated with Muhammad uh, meant that you were living a very hard life. And this lasted for several years until a tribe, a clan called Ben Nawfal, decided that they've had enough. The reputation of Mecca had taken a hit. Uh, Mecca prided themselves on being a generous people. And the Ben Nawfal, when they saw what was happening to their own people, they were very angry at at what was going on, and they decided that this boycott had to end. They gathered the other Meccan uh, tribe, the Meccan clans, and they tore off the treaty that called for a boycott of the Muslims. Interestingly, the Banu Nawfal would also offer Muhammad protection when his uncle died. Uh, when his uncle died and the Meccans wanted to kill him, the Banu Nawfal said, no, we're going to protect him. Even though they were not Muslim uh, at this time. It was all about honor. But the thing is, Islam continued to grow and it became more popular. So the council decided that they had to kill him off. They're like, this is the only way we're going to get rid of this. And a man named Amr ibn Hisham, who Muslims call Abu Jahl, or the father of ignorance, came up with a plan to kill Muhammad without pissing off the Banu Nawfal. And he decided to do that by gathering seven men from seven different clans. And these seven men would kill him together in the middle of the night. There you go. Boom. So all of them would, uh, would kill him at the same time, so no clan got claimed, and the Banu Nawfal could not retaliate in any way. But Muhammad learned of their, uh, of their clan, and he managed to escape from Mecca. And what happened was a small, a small group of his followers uh, his followers had made their way to Yathrib, and they had grown into a, about a community of 75. And these 75 men and women came to meet him at a place called Al Aqaba, near just north of Saudi Arabia. And they offered him refuge in Yathrib. And you might think to yourself, why would Yathrib want to bring in the Muslims who were causing nothing but trouble in, in, in Mecca? And the reason was Yathrib was involved in a civil war. And they could not find a solution to the war. And they had heard of Muhammad's reputation as an arbiter. So they made him an offer. They told him, you're going to come to Yathrib. You're going to find us a peace deal. And in return, we're going to offer you and the Muslims protection. Muhammad didn't actually want to take this deal up. He was against this deal. And he has a very famous quote. And this is according to Muslim tradition, because there's no way we can verify this, where he actually spoke directly to the city of Mecca and said, you are the most beloved land on earth to me, and if I was not forced to leave, I would never leave. He did not want to take this deal, but the Muslims really wanted it, because they were being treated very badly, and they're like, yo, we're being offered uh, protection in Yathrib, we're going to go to Yathrib. So he went to Yathrib, and he found, he managed to get a peace deal done between the, uh, the fighting tribes, and they created a brand new city-state. That was al Medina al Munawar, which is the name that this city is now known by. The city of light, or as it's commonly referred to by Muslims today, the city of the Prophet. Uh, they wrote a ruling document, the Constitution of Medina, and Muhammad and the Muslims were now a part of a brand new city-state that was going to start rivaling Mecca. And here lies a really big difference between Muhammad and a lot of other um, founders of religions like Jesus, is the fact that he became head of state. And this causes a lot of confusion amongst modern day Muslims. Because as head of state, he had to provide defense. He had to have an economic plan. There had to be a traditionary. And people would take his politics and say, this is religion now. Especially in the modern times. And it doesn't make sense to apply that. I mean, he ruled a city-state in the 6th century to say, like, yeah, what happened then totally applies. It makes no sense. And the biggest example is jihad, which I know is a little, it's a scary word, because you hear that on the news a lot, and like, oh, jihad. But we're going to get into that. Um, the Muslims immigrated to Medina, and they took their businesses with them, and they began to rival Medina. 
So what? Uh, a Meccan. They began to act a Meccan. So the Meccans decided they were going to sell off all Muslim property in Mecca. <coughs> the Medinians heard about this and they went out to intercept the caravan that was going to sell off the property. Mecca found out and they sent their army. In a famous battle called the Battle of Badr, the Meccans were defeated by a much smaller Muslim army which sent shockwaves throughout Arabia. And this was the first jihad. Now, I have two quotes here from Muhammad about jihad. These are both from the Hadith. The first one is, the greatest jihad is to stand up to an oppressive ruler. And the second one is him speaking after coming back from war, saying we've just returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. The word jihad doesn't mean holy war. It means struggle. The Arabic word for holy war is al-harb al-muqaddasa. Harb meaning war, muqaddasa meaning uh, holy. If any of you are familiar with the Arabic term for Jerusalem, it's al-Quds, which also comes from this word muqaddasa, meaning holy, a holy city. Um, the word that you might want to look for is actually Ghazwa. When Arab leaders or Muslim leaders historically have called for war and justified it using religion, they haven't always used jihad, they overwhelmingly used Ghazwa. Because Ghazwa is, uh, is a term that only applies to war, whereas jihad is a term that Muslims use every day and rarely is it used when it comes to war. But Muhammad would refer to all his struggles as jihad the war struggles, the struggles when it came to um, jihad and nafs, bettering yourself. And this, again, everything he says causes confusion when it comes to modern day. People would take anything he says, it's like, we're going to a jihad, and it's a war. That's a holy war, because he participated in it. He participated in his uh, vicinity as head of state, but now it's a holy war, which is very problematic. Okay. Now, the years passed. And Medina actually got stronger. They beat Mecca in um, a lot more battles, and um, a lot more tribes were allying themselves with Medina over Mecca. And one day, Muhammad decided that he was going to go back to Mecca. He decided that along with his followers, they were going to go to Mecca, and they were going to go without any weapons. They were going to go back to that, that cube, that Kaaba, and they were going to make pilgrimage. The Meccans were outraged, because they couldn't attack him, he was coming without any weapons. He had declared that he's coming as a pilgrim, but at the same time, they couldn't let the Muslims enter Mecca. That would be the end of the war without any battle. They would lose the war. The Muslims are in Mecca. So they decided to offer Muhammad a peace deal. And this is called the Treaty of uh, Hudaybiyah. This is the actual treaty. Now, we're not going to go over all of it, just a little bit. Uh, number one, the Meccans refused to refer to him by his Muslim title, insisting on him using his pagan name. Uh, Muhammad didn't have to do that. Number two, they agreed to a 10-year peace deal. And the key part of this peace deal is anybody in Arabia could join. You had tribes that allied themselves with the Meccans and tribes that allied themselves with Muhammad. And the peace deal said that the Meccans and the Medinians, they had to protect the tribes that uh, signed on with them. And this is the key part. Because the peace deal was broken. Not by Mecca, not by Medina, but by a tribe that had allied themselves with Mecca. A tribe called the Ben Mubak. And they broke this uh, treaty within a few months of its signing. Now they had some help with some, uh, from uh, the Meccan council, uh, but the tribe that got attacked, the Ben Khuza'a, turned to the man who had signed his name as their protector. And they asked him for help. And they were not Muslim, they were pagan, which leads to our conquest of Mecca. But, quick review, Muhammad is born in Mecca in the year 570. At the age of 40, he begins preaching a brand new religion, challenging the Meccan status quo. His followers are tortured, boycotted, and they're forced out of the city. They immigrate to Yathrib, they start challenging Mecca, they overtake Mecca as the dominant power, and this is where we're at, the conquest of Mecca. Medina responds to the violation of the treaty by raising an army of 10,000, the biggest army that they had ever raised. And I want you guys to look at the flags that they're wearing. You guys see anything familiar about those flags? The flags that the Muslims had when they wanted to fight. Do they look familiar to anyone? Those are the flags used by ISIS, uh, Al Qaeda, Shabab, uh, and any other terrorist organization you can imagine. That's where the inspiration 
for uh, ancient times come from. Now the actual flag of Medina is this white flag. Medina had a white banner. The black banner, the infamous black banner that you see ISIS and Al-Qaeda waving, that was the personal banner of Muhammad. Whenever the army was marching out, they would always identify his location with a black banner. The state had a white banner, and his personal banner was the black banner. And this is actually an image. I believe this is, I think this is Ottoman, but I could be wrong. Um, depicting the conquest of Mecca. The Muslims entered Mecca without a fight. A few uh, council members killed um, some Muslim soldiers, but the Muslims let them go because they did not want to spill any um, blood on their special day. Um, and Muhammad made his way to the Kaaba, and he called the Quraysh, his tribe, to him. Now he found himself in an interesting position because he conquered Mecca because they had violated the treaty. And under Arab law, that means they're going to either be enslaved or executed. That's what the Quraysh were preparing for. That's what the tribe that got um, attacked were expecting. Um, but had he actually done that, he would have probably lost his entire following because he finds himself in this middle ground between pagan, pagan uh, rituals and what he's been preaching. So, instead, he decides to kill all their gods. He goes to the Kaaba and he breaks all the idol gods surrounding the Kaaba. Which, number one, it made the Muslims happy because they got the Kaaba and it made the Banu Khuza happy because they saw the revenge on the gods as an even greater revenge than had he taken out the people of Mecca. So he let the people of Mecca, he told them there's not going to be any harm that's going to fall onto you. We're going to take out the gods. My people are happy. The Banu Khuza are happy. You're happy because you're alive. And by doing that, he retook Mecca, he incorporated Mecca into his state, and a caliphate was born. Now, after his death, his close friend and his father-in-law, Abu Bakr Siddiq, was elected as his successor, as the first caliph. And immediately, the young states revolted against Abu Bakr. While there were a lot of tribes that had accepted Muhammad as leader, they did not accept Abu Bakr. He was seen as a much weaker leader. And Abu Bakr had to go to war. He went to war in a series of battles called the Riddle Wars, reuniting the caliphate. Um, he ruled for two years. He ruled for two years and two months, and he died, appointing his close advisor, um, Omar, as his successor. Omar had a much longer reign. He reigned for uh, 10 years, and he is the one who oversaw the, uh, the caliphate turned into an empire, although a little bit accidentally, we'll get into that. Um, at the time all this was happening, the Romans and the Persians had been going to war, and they had both gone broke. So you had Arab tribes that had allied themselves with this brand new state that just began raiding Roman and Persian land. They saw very little resistance, and they began taking all this land in and announcing it as a part of this new caliphate. Now, as, these, as the land started coming in, Abu Bakr and Omar, they weren't going to they weren't going to say no. I mean, they weren't expecting all this land, but they weren't going to say no. They're like, we got all this brand new property. All right, praise Allah. Now, um, yes, we went over that. Now, as they started gaining more lands, their army started growing, and the Muslims actually started challenging the Persians and the Romans, actually taking territory like Syria, South Iran, Iraq. They started taking um, real land from the uh, from the Persians and uh, and the Romans, and. The best example, though, of an accidental empire is the conquest of Egypt. Because the Caliph had ordered that Egypt not be attacked. Egypt was under Roman rule, and the Caliph Omar said, we are not allowed to attack Egypt, but an Arab army that was based in Palestine at the time decided that the Roman defenses were weak, and they attacked Egypt anyway. What, what are you going to do? Your, army, your empire just doubled. It's not like you're going to punish the, uh, the army that attacked, right? Now, Omar reigned for 10 years. Uh, he was assassinated while in prayer, and his death brought an end to the infancy of the Medinian state, because by the time he died, Medina was no longer just a, a state in Arabia. It was now in North Africa, in the Middle East, and in Iran. So, you had Muhammad, the founder of the religion, and the founder of the Medinian state, Abu Bakr, who was the first caliph, he ruled for two years, and Omar, who under him, the empire, uh, the state, 
uh, turned into an empire. And these are actually their graves. Uh, this is actually the tomb of uh, Muhammad, which is in Medina, uh, Abu Bakr, and Omar. Both of them were buried right beside the founder of their religion. Which brings us to the last point. Oh, yes. Muhammad returned to Mecca, he forgave the city, Arabia was united, Abu Bakr was elected the first caliph, he fought against the rebellious tribe to keep the new state from breaking up. Omar turned the uh, state into an empire, and he was assassinated and buried next to Muhammad and Abu Bakr at the permission of Abu Bakr's daughter, Aisha. And now we have Uthman, who in my opinion uh, was the turning point for the Muslims. This is the grave of Uthman. It's not as fancy as the other two graves that you saw, and there's, there's good reason for that. Um, Uthman was elected from among six candidates as the successor to Omar. Uh, he was very different from the first two caliphs in that he inherited an empire. So right away, he saw the need for a much larger government than the one they had under Muhammad, under Abu Bakr, and under Omar. So what he decided to do was, while well, he focused on um, fixing the economic structures of the, of the caliphate, he gave his tribe, the Umayyad tribe, full control over the military, um, over vast areas uh, of the empire. He started appointing Umayyads to governorships all over, uh, all over the empire. And pretty quickly, you saw a revival of a lot of the old pagan rivalries because the empire was falling into the hands of one family. And that was Uthman's family. Now, his caliphate was, he was very wealthy. Uh, it, it was very wealthy under him. He was a very successful uh, caliph, which is why this is a little bit puzzling. Um, the empire was very wealthy. It was at its healthiest it's ever been. Um, but people were very angry because the Umayyads were in control of everything on both men. So, he had a revolt. There was an, there was an actual revolt on his hands. Uh, a rebellion broke out from Egypt. 1,000 soldiers. Uh, began to prepare for a march on Medina. And what ended up happening was Uthman's secretary, a man named Marwan ibn al-Hakim, wrote to the governor of Egypt telling him to kill the rebels. Uh, the problem is this letter was intercepted by the rebels, and assuming that Uthman wrote the rebels, uh, wrote the, uh, the letter, they decided they were going to kill Uthman instead. So they went to Medina, where Ali, a man, uh, the son-in-law of Muhammad, was uh, hired as a mediator, tried to ask Uthman about the letter. Uthman denied any knowledge, the rebels did not believe him, and they attacked Uthman's house. Uthman was killed, um, everything in his uh, home was stolen, and they wouldn't allow him to be buried into, in a Muslim graveyard. When his family brought the, uh, his body to the Muslim graveyard, the rebels wouldn't allow it. They had to bury him in the Jewish graveyard, although later the Umayyads would destroy the wall between the two, ensuring that their ancestor was buried in a Muslim graveyard. Which is why he had such a very humble grave in comparison to the other caliphs. Now, Uthman's death led to, um, left the empire in turmoil, and the man who was hired to be a mediator, Ali, was actually turned to, to um, leave the empire. And that is actually a picture of Ali. He is the only figure, he is the only figure in Islam that all Muslim sects agree on. The Shias, they don't like Abu Bakr, they don't like Omar, they don't like Uthman. The Sunnis, they don't like a lot of the Shia demands. The one person they all agree on is Ali, uh, and this is the tomb of Ali, a little bit fancier than that of Uthman's. Um, Uthman kind of had a nastier ending than any of the other uh, caliphs. The rebels turned to, um, to Ali, and they told him that he would be the new caliph, and he refused. So they made an announcement in Medina, and they said that the city had one day to elect a new caliph, or else they would make the decision for them. Uh, Medina elected Ali, and he refused once again, so they forced him on it by pledging their allegiance to him against his will. The reason he refused was he didn't want to be known as the caliph of the rebels. He didn't actually agree with what happened, and he was scared that his reign would be um, seen through what happened to Uthman. But at the end of the day, he was forced to be caliph, um, and 
you have to enter into talks with the Umayyads. The Umayyads at this point had been uh, ruling most of the empire, thanks to the policies of Uthman. And they wanted Uthman avenged. When Ali did not kill the rebels, the Umayyads, with the help of the widow of Muhammad, went to war. In a battle known as the Battle of the Camel, Ali defeated the Umayyads and Muhammad's widow, and he had to move. He moved the capital of Medina to Iraq. He moved it to Iraq, but he also met his end in Iraq. Four years later, he had a rebellion by a group known as the Kharajites. The Kharajites killed him, and this pretty much brought an end to any uh, to the state that was built by Muhammad. Because at this point, the leader of the Umayyads, a man named Muawiyah, decided that he was going to become the new caliph. He crowned himself as the caliph in Jerusalem, and for the next 91 years, the role of caliph became a hereditary, a hereditary role. His son became caliph after him. His grandson was the next caliph. And the Umayyads would rule until the Hashemites would overthrow them almost a century later. Now, you've seen a few things um, in this presentation that you might recognize from the news, like the flags or the terms. And the reason for this is because there's a crisis of identity among a lot of Muslims uh, in, the, in the Middle East and in Africa. They believe that their culture, their identity is under threat because of globalization, because of American movies, because English and French are coming in. And they see that any revolution that they're going to have, it's got to, it's got to mimic what happened in the past. That's why they changed their names to match these people. That's why they use the flags that Muhammad used. Even when Muhammad broke the gods in Mecca, he destroyed the idols in Mecca, that's what you saw ISIS doing in Iraq. When they went into Iraq, they started destroying any of the um, gods of Mesopotamia. They try to mimic everything because they try to create an emotional connection to the past, uh, to Islamic history. Um, and I'm done. That's all I have. I know that was a lot. Um, and, but I actually cut out like 70% of what I have to say. I'm glad I got through it all. Thank you for listening.
they, they're not buying in to where their countries are. They're not buying into globalization. Um, yeah. Do, do you see any, I guess, the emphasis on my question was uh, not only with extremists in the Middle East, but also just around the world because of the, uh, the reaction is kind of a human reaction. So, you know, in the West, we have Brexit and we have Trump. Uh, in Asia, there might be more nationalistic uh, sentiments also. So, you know, I, my question is not just directed towards what's going on in the Middle East, but, you know, I think all around the world we want to protect our cultures, and we've got this kind of massive tidal wave of globalization that is kind of taking away our individual identity. So I, I almost see the, what's going on in the Middle East, even though it's more extreme, uh, as kind of uh, a human reaction to protect your identity and culture, whether you're Asian or Eastern or Jewish or whatever? I don't have an answer for you. Um, I don't know how we, uh, we balance those out. Everybody is going to be different, and for some people there's no balance. You're either, you're either Muslim and this type of Muslim, or you don't belong. That's, I mean, in the West, when you talk about what's going on in the US or, or in, uh, in the UK, for some people it's about color. And it doesn't matter if you buy into the culture, if you don't look a certain way, you don't belong. And it's, it's very similar. If you're going to start watching American movies, if you're going to start learning English, there is no coexistence for us. That's how it is. There's no balance. I think that's that's where they're at. For, for the rest of the people in the Middle East, are, are, you know, in general, I don't think people have the same extreme reaction where they feel like watching some movies or learning a foreign language means they've lost their identity. They're no longer um, Korean or American. But I think for these people, they're past this point. There is no coexistence uh, of ideas. Why ISIS break out parents to the word now? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, for ISIS, it's about um, for, it's it's actually connected. It's about identity. They feel like their Muslim identity is under threat. They feel like there is a war against Islam. They think that any new ideas that come into the Middle East or any um, any coexistence between Muslims and non-Muslims as a threat to how things should be. Um, they don't want a, uh, a multicultural Middle East. They don't want to see uh, American movies or women dressing the way they do in the West. They don't want to see any of that. That's, that's all our reaction. And interestingly, you can trace back a lot of this terrorism to um, a man in Saudi Arabia in the 70s. A lot of this was born uh, at that time when Saudi Arabia had a lot of Western movies and a lot of Western music, I know Saudi Arabia was still on TV at that time. And there was an attack on Mecca. There was a man, his name, I can't remember, his name was Julai Beya or something like this. Um, I can search it up. But uh, he, uh, along with a few followers, he attacked Mecca. And he held Mecca hostage for about three weeks. They went in with coffins, and inside the coffins, instead of dead bodies, he had armed uh, soldiers. They burst out and they kept the mosque hostage for three weeks. And Osama bin Laden actually cited him as an example when he was talking about attacking the U.S. So for, for this man, what drove him was the fact that he thought Arabia had lost its identity. He thought Arabia was westernized. And we're talking about Saudi Arabia. If Saudi Arabia is westernizing, how do you think the extremists feel in North Africa? Um, he thought Saudi Arabia was becoming too western. Um, so. It's, they feel like their identity is being stolen from them, and they're convinced that there is a global conspiracy to get rid of Islam. Okay. The next question is, your personal belief about the religion and religion? Person? I'm Muslim. Uh, <laughs> uh, I studied American foreign policy. <laughs> I studied the Middle East a lot. 
Um, so I researched its history quite a bit. More about your background, a, a bit more. Where, where you okay. Um, <laughs> my parents are Egyptian. Um, I'm from Washington D.C. or from the area around Washington D.C. I studied um, American foreign policy, uh, focused on the Middle East for a very long time. I did a lot of my research on these uh, extremist groups and um, how people got radicalized, why they got radicalized, what drove them to join these extremist groups. Um, I am Muslim. Um, it's something that I've struggled with at times, but I, I do uh, I do identify as a Muslim. Uh, Sufi, if, if you're also wondering what the sect. Um, and uh, I, I really like basketball. Um, and Japanese food, if anybody's interested in buying me dinner, Japanese food is very good. Fringe ideology. 
And that's, what, that's where this fight has to start. It's got to start against these countries that propagate this extreme message. Because I think, I really do believe this, that the Gulf countries, they're the ones who are pushing this trend. Because as they become normalized, it allows for an even uh, a more extreme version to, uh, to arise. That says, okay, yeah, they're not real either. They used to be the extreme that looked at everybody else and said, you're not real Muslims, and there's an attack on our, uh, on our culture. Once they became normalized, an even more extreme group appears like, yeah, they're also not, uh, not real Muslims. We're the real Muslims. So you have to fight against the ideology coming from these countries, because this is what allows for, uh, for these groups to exist to begin with. You've normalized these ideas. You're like, Saudi Arabia is... They represent, they represent uh, Islam now. The U.S. President, Donald Trump, was recently in Saudi Arabia, um, giving them billions of dollars of weapons. I mean, they've become an accepted part of the international community. And it's like, they can't be an, ex an accepted part of the international community. They go against everything that the international community is supposed to be built on. Um, but that's, that's my, my way of thinking. Thank you very much. And the real question is like when the America is having the deal with uh, Saudi Arabia, an arms deal, mm. and they're saying that Qatar is the terrorist groups, mm. and now they're really having the deal with the Qatar mm. and selling the arms. Mm. So what is the role of US? I mean, the international community. Money. They're, they're really, uh, really trying to solve this problem, or they're doing the business. It's all about money. I mean, the US back when uh, when the communists were ruling Afghanistan, the US aided the Mujahideen and the successors to the Mujahideen were the Taliban. And the U.S. didn't care, it was about the communism. It was about fighting communism at the time. The U.S. got rid of, uh, in the coup in Iran, they got rid of a uh, socialist uh, leader, who was a socialist prime minister elected in Iran because they thought he would be too close to Russia, uh, to the Soviet Union. Um, it's all about money. The Saudis could come out and wave the ISIS flag, but if they give a lot of money to the U.S., it's not just the U.S., it's, it's every country. It's, it's all about money, it's all about business. I don't think the U.S., um, supports ISIS. I just think the U.S. is like every other country. They're interested in making money. Um, Not to solve that problem. I definitely don't believe the U.S. is trying to solve the problem. I don't believe that. <laughs> okay, can we do... Uh, I have a we, question. Sorry, sorry, we had this gentleman uh, raise his hand first. And then kind of disconnected with the previous one. Okay. As you mentioned, here right. here, last, two, last two questions here and then here. So I guess this is also related to like the current crisis in the Gulf, like mm. the Qatar versus everybody else, it seems. So I'm curious then is like, so Qatar's ideology, is it rather different from that of the other Gulf states? No, not that. I mean, it's, it's a little bit relaxed compared to Saudi Arabia, yeah. but compared to Denmark. <laughs> um, right, but is it, so is it still like a Wahhabi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like a relaxed version of Wahhabism, right. um, where uh, they allow, uh, people of other faiths to build uh, their religious centers as long as there's no like crosses um, outside the church or something like that where women can drive but you're still expected to cover or you can drink as long as you know it's not a, you know you're not selling alcohol openly uh, it's like yeah. it's on the surface they want to appear like Saudi Arabia and like as long as you know you're not too open about what you're doing you can do what you want to do that I see and it also allows ideas like, is it, like Al Jazeera is from Qatar yeah right? so they permit things like this well, Al Jazeera, there's two very different versions of Al Jazeera. There's the Arabic version and the English version. Okay. And I watch both, and they're not the same thing. Okay. Like, the Arabic version is, is, is they target an Arab audience, mm -hmm. and they present a much more conservative uh, message than the English version does. The English version is, um, they're trying to get a, a Western audience to view them, and they, it is a much better version. Um, I, I don't have any problem with what they do on uh, Al Jazeera English. Yeah. The Arabic version is very conservative during the uh, Egyptian crisis. And I, I, I really do not like the Egyptian president, but they were openly supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, they were not impartial. They, they, they take a very conservative... Um, they present a very conservative yeah, side okay. to every story. Yeah. It's two, diff two very different channels. Yes. Very never... good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we'll take one last question okay. here, and then you uh, can ask yeah. your question. Yeah, is the Islamic State that has been uh, destroying the universal value for human race anywhere in the world. So, uh, actually, we are glad going to a foreign country is on a uh, one trip uh, for uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
Do you have any idea what is the uh, best solution to deal with the extremists of Islamic State? Do you have any, uh, any so idea of how, you, uh, how going, to treat? Yeah. You're going to Russia? And you're worried of no, an attack? Islamic State. Yeah, I, I said extremist. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. He's asking if you travel to Russia. You said something about Russia. Russia. Right? Uh, if I go, if I should go to France ah. or many, many other countries, uh, America, we have, we are facing the danger of. Oh, like yeah. how, how do you recognize yeah. them? Yeah, yeah. How, you can't recognize them. I mean, these are people no, no, who no. radicalized. What is the uh, best solution? To uh, get to uh, remove those ah. extremists from our daily lives. Like I said, I believe the main thing is attacking the yeah. uh, the ideology that's coming out of the Gulf countries. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that all of this extremism is born out of this Wahhabi ideology. Mm -hmm. This normalized and ex this normalized extremism in the Muslim world. When when Saudi Arabia's version of Islam became accepted, like this is legitimate, you can actually say this represents Muslims, this normalized extremism in the Muslim world. And the Saudis, the way they talk, or the Saudi government, the way they talk about, um, about women, the way they talk about gay people, the way they talk about foreigners, uh, they've normalized all this hatred. And the Saudis are not just, it's not just in Saudi Arabia. They build mosques all over the world. Where, where I'm from in DC, there was a new mosque that was built there that was funded by the Saudi government. I've never been there, and I don't want to ever go there, because I'm not sure if there is a, an imam that's approved by the Saudis, by the Saudi government, I'm not sure that's someone you can trust with, uh, with teaching this religion, because there is a extremist uh, take that they take on everything. And this has allowed for, uh, for, for groups like ISIS, for groups like Al-Qaeda to emerge. So I think number one, the world has to uh, has to stop normalizing uh, this Wahhabi Gulf version of Islam. I think this is the mother of all these ideologies. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that'll be our last question. Please feel free to stay after and ask Kesham question one. Um, but 
I, I don't think it's fair, no. Yeah, but still, uh, <clears throat> I have more questions about this. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Some uh, Muslims in Europe, mm. uh, mostly in Belgium, for example, they believe that if their population grows, mm. they can implement Sharia law in Belgium. Mm. That is their conviction. Mm -hmm. What do you think about their conviction and then the future? No, I think it's flawed because uh, a lot of the people who are born in Belgium or born in Europe tend to identify with, with Belgium and with Europe or wherever they're born. So I think it's a little bit flawed. Um, I also don't think that they'll be very successful because they've got a whole lot of Muslims in the Middle East and they haven't been too good at implementing their Sharia law in North Africa or, um, or Syria or before, before the ISIS people took over. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I think that people born in Belgium, raised in Belgium, they see the good life that they have in Belgium, I don't think they are in a rush to throw that away for ISIS. Um, I know not, some not, people... Not ISIS, but people in Belgium, yeah. they try to promote the Sharia law. Sure. When they... Uh, there are districts where there are many Muslims, yeah. majority Muslims, they want to implement that strict Muslim law mm -hmm. in that district, for example. <coughs> that if they gain more power in the future, they may implement Sharia law in Belgium, nationwide. I see. Do you think it is possible? Um, I don't think so, no. Because I think, again, I think um, what, what they have when they're born in Belgium, I think it's better for them. It's more appealing to them than what's being offered. Uh, one more question. <laughs> the, in the Western world, uh, Christian world exactly, they used to have extremism as current Muslims have. But they have developed further, civilized rather, and then they, uh, the, the extremism number of extremism is very small. But why do you have so many extremists in Muslim world? Because Muhammad was the head of state. And it's hard for a lot of people to uh, separate uh, his politics from religion. Because unlike Jesus, Muhammad actually had a state. Like Christianity grew up in the Roman Empire. And a lot of stuff that they adapted was from pagan Rome. Um, Islam produced its own states. They produced the Rashidun Caliphate. They produce the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Fatimids, the Ottomans. And so for a lot of Muslims and for a lot of extremists, it's really hard to separate politics from religion. Because they see if the Prophet was head of state and if the religion produced many states, there is no separation. Islam for them is not just a religion, it's also a, a political system as well. And it's very flawed because you're talking about a, a, a man who ruled in the 6th century. I mean, what he had, what he was working with, what he was doing, cannot be applied today. Um, it's flawed, but that's their reasoning. Their reasoning is, he was a head of state, and there's no separation between the two. Still you believe in no separation? Me? No, I believe in separation of uh, religion from state. I'm talking about, I'm answering your question. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> still, I was quite surprised to see the development in Turkey. Mm. They are good, they are trying to be, they are becoming more conservative, yeah. more Islam state yeah. than before. Yeah. Uh, even in this kind of modern world, mm. they are going backward. Are. What do you think of the development in Turkey? I think, I think what happened in Turkey was because a lot of secularism was kind of forced on Turkey. With Ataturk, he was not really um, this, this great democratic leader, he was a dictator at the end. And a lot of people saw the emergence of Erdogan, who, who was very successful in his early yeah. years. Um, economically, the country was very prosperous under him. They saw his emergence as um, like this new era for Turkey where they're moving forward, they're becoming a richer country, while staying true to their traditions. Um, and that's, that's where his popularity comes in. He's very popular because he's seen in Turkey from his past as a man who understands economics and who can connect them to their traditions. But there is a there is a gulf between the Turkish um, youth and the Turkish um, elders. 
because in the in the last Turkish referendum, the majority of the youth voted um, against Erdogan yes. in a very 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 tight result that was probably tempered with when he won 51 to 49. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's not as popular as he once was. Now that the country is entering into conflict and they're having these attacks because of ISIS, but that's where his popularity was more. That's why. <laughs> you, do you think that the Islamic world will be eventually further liberalized? 